I went to my, uh, my auntie's funeral this week and I ended up going twice because I got the wrong date, so kind of threw me off my time a bit. Okay, so we have key teaser. So, Yehovah said to Moses, When you take the census of the people of Israel, and each shall give a ransom for his life to Yehovah, when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 gerahs. Half a shekel is an offering to Yehovah. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upwards shall give Yehovah's offering. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel when you give Yehovah's offering to make atonement for your lives. You shall take the atonement money for the people of Israel and shall give it to the, for the service of the tent of meeting that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before Yehovah so as to make atonement for your lives. So those are the first six verses of the Parsha. <clears throat> Um, and what a journey they take you on. Now actually, you could just read it flat and cold and think, oh, okay. But they take you when you actually look into them on a journey right up to the end of the age. And you can see those who can be numbered and those that cannot. To see those that are sealed and those that suffer the plagues. And it talks about what is going on in the end times. There's a lot in it. And if you're wondering what I'm going on about, then I recommend you watch the following teachings. I remember having my mind blown. I remember the first time it was like a, I was looking at it for doing the study of a Torah portion. And I was breaking down what the Torah portion <laughs> would be about and what it's like. And I remember thinking, that bit, that'll be, I'll just, that'll be quick and then we'll just move on to this bit. And then as I looked at it, it began with JP's help. It just became this huge big thing it's like wow who could have thought in them, them six verses to be so much it was like going on a crazy roller coaster ride it was like oh, should that, oh. I remember it just being quite a remarkable thing and of course it is an incredible thing when we see great truths in Jehovah's word when we see how it all knits together so perfectly it impacts us powerfully the word is amazing. And those teachings were full of wonderful discovery. But there are some things in Yehovah's word that cannot be fully appreciated until experience teaches you. For example, you cannot fully appreciate how Yehovah feels when he laments that Israel is bride of played the whore until you've experienced to some extent what it feels like to feel betrayed. Until last week, I never fully understood my son. Do not despise Yehovah's discipline or be wary of his reproof. Yehovah reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. I never really appreciated the powerful truth in those words. I now appreciate Yehovah in a way that goes beyond how I appreciated him previously. And I'll be talking about that in part two, probably. He is amazing. And I know it even more now. David said he meditated on the Torah all day. He said, oh, how I love your Torah it is my meditation all the day. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. I bet he wasn't always looking to find great mysteries, but that he spent lots of time just quietly reflecting and enjoying the beauty of the one it describes. He understood how precious it is to you. The grass, the grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of God endures forever. I wait for Yehovah, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. We've looked at this before, to wait, to be bound together. I bind myself together with Yehovah. All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares Yehovah. But this is the one to whom I will look. He was humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. 
Yehovah, the creator of all things, says that he looks to those who tremble at his word. These are those he describes as the humble. Indeed, in 1 Peter we read, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he might exalt you. Casting all your anxieties upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. To be humble before Yehovah is to have reverence for his word, as opposed to what most people do, which is to lightly esteem it. We can trust in his word, it is unchanging. Forever, O Yehovah, your word is settled in heaven. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. His loving kindness is kindness that is great towards us, and the truth of Yehovah is everlasting. Praise Yehovah. We can trust in Yehovah. I, Yehovah, do not change. Just like his word. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, with, was within God, and the Word was God, was with God. If you want to know who the creator of all things is, then read his Word. His Word doesn't change, because he doesn't change. In the Word, we discover exactly who it is we serve. In much the same way that we get to truly know somebody by spending time with them. When we read his Word again and again, we get to know him more and more intimately. As we'll see as we go on, it's not just about reading it. His word is supernatural and through it, Yehovah continues to teach us, to amaze us, to challenge us and to encourage us. The word is amazing because Yehovah is amazing. Long may he continue to reveal himself to us through scripture. And now we're going to move on to learn about another piece of furniture in the tabernacle. We're going to look at the bronze laver, which is closely related to the word. Yehovah said to Moses, you shall also make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing, and you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, with which Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet. And when they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn a food offering to Yehovah, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. So after entering into the only gate at the east end of the court, and after sacrificing at the brazen altar, the priest then proceeds to the holy place. However, after the sacrifice has been made, but before he can minister or approach Jehovah, he must wash in the laver lest he die. Anyone unclean coming into the midst of the manifest presence of Yehovah will die. We read in Leviticus 15. Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. Just as it is not a good idea to get too close to a live electrical source, approaching the physical manifest presence of Yehovah is also not a good idea if you are unclean. Now in Hebrew, the word for laver is kiao, however you pronounce that. It is also the word for furnace. We see in Proverbs 70, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace, the same word for gold, but Yehovah tests the hearts. And this word actually carries the connotation of to purify. The bronze laver speaks to us of being washed in the water of the world, and we'll see this as we go through. Remember, we are to be found without blemish or spot. We read this in Ephesians. That he might sanctify the church, this is Yeshua, having cleansed it by what? By the washing of water, by the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. And in Exodus 38 we read, And he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass, of the looking glasses, the mirrors of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And that is very fitting. For it is in reflections that emanate from this laver that we begin to see ourselves as we really are. 
Indeed, the word lets us know where we are at. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, it is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When you look into the word, you can really, really see where you're at. And the word is incredible and your response to Yehovah's word will reveal your heart. Now in Exodus 29, Aaron and his sons are washed from head to toe in preparation for their ministry. The labor, however, is for the daily washing of the feet and hands only. And the difference between a full immersion and a daily washing is pictured in John 13. Yeshua washes the disciples' feet. We read. Now before the feast of Passover, when Yeshua would know that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So, Yeshua poured water into a basin, it says, and this is given to us very specifically as was the instructions regarding the bronze basin. Scripture doesn't waste any words, does it? We read in Exodus 30, You shall make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar. You shall put water in it. You could think, well, that's a pretty redundant phrase if we're going to be using it for washing, but it's important. Everything in Scripture is there for a reason. You shall put water in it. It may seem an obvious station, but, uh, statement, but Scripture does not waste words. There's a connection here between what Yeshua is doing and the instructions for the bronze basin or lever. And he said to Simon Peter, uh, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Yeshua answered and he said to him, what I do you know not now, but you shall know hereafter. Now, what Yeshua is doing is demonstrating what it means to be a servant and what it is to be called to serve. But there's much more going on here besides that. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Yeshua answered him and he said, if I wash you not, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Yeshua said to him, he that is washed... And this is this word, luo, need not save to wash, and a completely different word there, his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. And the word for luo there, here we have it, to bathe the whole person. Okay, whereas this other word is to cleanse, especially the hands, the feet, and the face to wash oneself as opposed to a complete cleansing. He that is washed, Luo, need not save to wash his feet. And this word for washed used here is a pretty unique word that occurs only five other times throughout the scriptures. Here's one, Revelation 1, it says, And from Yeshua Hamashiach, who was the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And it's this word, Lua. 2 Peter 2.22 What the true proverb says is that has happened to them, the dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow that was washed, washed of its sins, as used in the other scripture, returns to do what? To wallow in the mire. And Hebrews 10.22 Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
washed and the consecration of the priests in the Septuagint. We can see it used again. This is the thing that thou shalt do unto them, to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock, uh, bullock and that's a funny turn of phrase, but sorry, and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened, tempered with oil, and wafers unleavened, anointed with oil, of wheat and flour shalt thou make them. And thou shalt put them into one basket and bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And do what? You shall wash them with water. So this bathing is associated with becoming a priest, which of course is a calling that we have. We read in Exodus 19, talking about, <clears throat> if you shema my voice, the Lord says, you'll be a peculiar treasure to me above all people. You'll be, what? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And indeed, in 1 Peter 2, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. This is a calling we all have. So the consecration is also mentioned later in the book of Exodus. She'll bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And, and it's this word again, Luo, wash them with water. So this was all about being ordinated to become a priest, to be able to minister before Yehovah. So let's go back to Yeshua's words. He that is washed, and we've seen some of these things, what it means, need not save to wash his feet. Where washed is associated with being cleansed from sin. It is associated with being fully immersed and cleansed, ready for priestly robes and an ordination which allows one to begin to serve as a priest in the tabernacle. So bearing this in mind, we can begin to see the correlation between Yeshua's washing of the feet with the water in the basin, with what went on in the bronze laver, and the washing of the priests with the water in the bronze laver as they served in the tabernacle. So... What effectively he's doing here is what they would be doing when they would go and wash in the bronze laver. Just as Yeshua said, you've, you've been washed. All you need to do now is to wash your feet. So these priests, they were fully immersed and they were washed so that they could become priests, but they would still go and wash in this bronze laver. So let's read from John 13 once more, just so we know we've got it. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Yeshua said to him, he that is washed, okay, this whole washing, which we see with these priests, need not save to wash, this washing of yourself, um, his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. And then we go on in the passage, it says, for he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. Now, Hands are an idiom for what you do, and washing the head is an idiom of having a clean heart, because the head and the heart are linked in Hebrew thought, aren't they? Who shall ascend the hill of Yehovah, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. James 4, 8, we read, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded. So now here we have priestly language, draw near. In Hebrew, from the word for draw near, karav, we get the word for offering korban. To have hands and heart and mind cleansed is to be washed. This is the washing luo that we looked at. The call here is for sinners to come and be washed, to be clean of their sins. This is a call for repentance. It talks about the double-minded, running after the ways of the world when things seem difficult. We read in Psalm 84, Jehovah God is a sun and a shield, and Jehovah bestows grace and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And the word for uprightly is tamim, which means completely, having integrity entirely. The opposite of being double-minded. And I'd just say to you, if you have not walked uprightly, if you have been double-minded, then you need to repent. If it's been a bit of a case of, well, I'll kind of just go along with the flow, but if, oh, in this instance, I'll just have to forget it. Now, the idea of Yehovah's people being double-minded reminds me of this verse. 1 Kings 18, Elijah came near to all the people and he said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If Jehovah is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. 
So many people profess to love Yehovah and to be his and to be <coughs> one of his children. To know who he is and to have faith in him, to believe in him. But their lives don't reflect that at all. If Yehovah is God, follow him. Fully, completely, uprightly, tamim, with everything that you've got. If Yehovah is God, follow him. Walk in his ways. Now the purification of the flesh at the priest's ordination involved the mikvah, the baptism, the full immersion. And it was all about washing the flesh. When we're baptised, full immersion, it is an appeal for a clean conscience. 1 Peter 3.21 Baptism which corresponds to this now saves you not as a removal of debt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Yeshua HaMashiach. The purification of the conscience involves repentance. It involves being baptised into Yeshua's death that we might know eternal life through him. Baptism speaks of teshuva, which is repentance. Repentance, shuv, to turn. To turn from going your own way, which leads to death. To walking in Yehovah's ways, the paths of righteousness, the paths of life. For the commandments are directions that keep you on the path. The parent root for the word commandment, mitzvah, is zav, direction. Indeed, in Deuteronomy 4, to you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Just do his word. Don't deviate from it one way or the other. Be upright, be fully committed to Jehovah, walk in his ways. Baptism is all about dying to self. And from this point on, we are cleansed of our sin. That is the things that we have done, was represented by our hands, and our temples, our hearts and minds are purified by what Yeshua has done for us. And once we are cleansed, we can be the dwelling place of Yehovah's Spirit, which is the Spirit of Holiness. That we might, as one of his nation of priests, minister just as Aharon and his sons did in the earthly tabernacle. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You were bought with a price, Yeshua's blood, to glorify God in your body. Our bodies are the temple, the tabernacle, and we're called to serve as priests. We're to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Yeshua HaMashiach. Indeed, Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So everything that we see these priests do is a picture for us to learn from and how, we're to offer, how we are to be and how we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices, how we're to draw near to Jehovah. So we've said before there are three tabernacles mentioned in Scripture. The earthly tabernacle, the Mishkan, which deals with the flesh. Model after the heavenly tabernacle, the Mishkan, which deals with the cleansing of the conscience. And as we've just read, our bodies are a temple, it deals with the spirit. The earthly sacrifices are pictures of what Yeshua has achieved in the heavenly realm and serve as images of what Yehovah asks us to bring spiritually, thus completing the means by which we purify the body, the conscience, and the spirit. And we come with the Corban offerings, as we've just seen before. Korban from the word karav, which means to draw near. That's how we draw near. And it all begins with the whole offering, or the Ola offering, which is about complete surrender, which is also what baptism is all about. As we read earlier, let us draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed, and it's this word again, with pure water. So baptism is all about dying to self, it's all about repentance. And from this point on we've been cleansed. But just like the priests in the earthy tabernacle who were fully immersed when they were ordained, yet washed daily in the water of the bronze basin, the bronze laver, we also need to be taking care to be continually washed, continually washed in the water, which as we've seen is an idiom for the word. And for all of us who've been baptised and turned to Yehovah, we can know this. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For as many of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's what baptism is all about. You go down into the water and you die to yourself and you raise up in the newness of life. So I ask you, <clears throat> do people get a sense of, well I ask myself, of who Yeshua is from their encounters with me? Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. I've died to self so that Christ might live, that I might be conformed to his image. And I ask myself, have I even come close to looking like Yeshua? Please let's not forget the example that was set by Yeshua in this as well when he was washing their feet. And I ask myself, and you can ask yourself, am I like Yeshua? Am I being conformed to his image? John 13 continued, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do, just as I have done to you. Yeshua, our example in all things. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So you're blessed, not just by knowing, but by doing. You sure are our example in all things. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments as a liar, and the truth is where it is not in him. Whoever keeps his, his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected, and by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked, ought to be like him. Matthew 16, he told his disciples, he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, lie to self, and follow me. It's an incredible invitation, isn't it? That he would say, come, follow me, come. Die to yourself. Come on, come follow me, walk in my ways and no life. Walk with me. There's not a thing about him that I don't like. Every word that came out of his mouth. Even difficult words that people might not want to hear. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Yeshua, our example in all things. So how else was the washing of their feet significant? Peter had said, not my feet only, but my head, my hands and my feet, but my hands and my head, sorry. Yeshua said, He that is washed need not save to wash his feet. I've seen the significance of having our heads, our hands and our head washed. So why wash the feet? The feet represent a person's walk. The washing of the feet speaks of our walk being righteous. We've just read, He whose mind should walk as I walked. But to be washed by the water of the word, that is, we are to walk according to the word. Perhaps it's also because of where we walk that we need to be constantly cleansed in the water of his word. We pick up dirt as a result of the places that we've been. We're bombarded with filth in this world. 
says in James 1, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It's not just the media, it's friends and family and work colleagues, it's what comes out of their mouths, it's their attitudes, it's the world. Sometimes it's obvious, you can be in a place and you can sense there's darkness in here, there's, un there's godlessness, it's just an unho unholy, unclean place. Other times it's maybe not so obvious. But what is clear is that even those who have been cleansed, Luo, this full immersion, speaks of us being baptised. Being ordained as priests to serve the Lord. Fully immersed, cleansed from sin. We need to wash. This is the washing of oneself. as represented by the bronze lever. Washed in the water of the word. We need to wash in the water of the word and ask you, have you ever felt a real, urgent, a real, a real urgent need for it? You ever come away from somewhere and just felt like, oh, I almost feel defiled in some kind of a way. I just want to draw near to the Lord. All of Yeshua's disciples were ministers of the kingdom except for Judas who had never been immersed, i.e., what I'm saying is he never truly repented and turned to Jehovah. Well, these were clothed with priestly garments, so to speak. And Yeshua makes it clear to them that they should be cleansed daily. He said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Yeshua said to him, he that is washed need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you were all clean, but not all. So hopefully we have a full understanding of what's being said by Yeshua in this instance. Just as the laver was filled with water and the priests were commanded to wash there at repeatedly in the service of the tabernacle. So how do we wash in this laver? By immersing ourselves in his word that we may do the works of the Father. To wash in the word of God is to apply the word to your life. He made the laver of brass, we read this before, and the, the, the foot of it brass of the looking glasses, the mirrors of the women assembling. The word washes because it reveals as the mirrors were revealers, and thus it's used for cleansing and beautifying. In it you can truly see where you're at. And one of the benefits derived from the word of God is declared by Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 to be correction. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. The word is profitable for correction. It cleanses by correcting us. Consider what it is that you have access to when you possess a copy of the Bible. The entrance of your word brings light and understanding to the simple. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the Torah of Yehovah, and on his Torah he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. What a beautiful image. If you haven't already, I ask you, will you come and be washed? Will you repent? Will you turn? Will you die to self as signified by entering the waters of baptism and rise to the newness of life as signified by coming up out of the waters? And to die to self means to submit yourself and to surrender yourself to God's care. Will you appeal to Yehovah for a clean conscience? Will you draw near and as a royal priest offer spiritual sacrifices? Will you come with all that you have? If you've been going the wrong way, then turn. I used to think because I was so bad when I was a drunk and various other things that I was into. I used to think there was no way that I could turn. There's no way that I could run back. I always used to remember the story of the prodigal son and think, yeah, but... But 
all throughout scripture the Lord's cry to people is repent, repent repent turn, turn to me come to me in return and in shuva and rest you shall be saved in quietness and in trust and confidence it's security shall be your strength and for those who have been washed what will you do will you return like a sow to wallowing in the mire let's read that passage from 2nd Peter once again this time starting a couple of verses earlier for some context if after they have escaped the defilements of the world the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Yeshua I'm a shirk. They are again entangled in and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Which is a big challenge, isn't it, to the people who say once saved, always saved. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow that was washed returns to wallow in the mire. Have you returned to your wallowing in the mire? I'm going to say that to everybody who might be watching this online. And I think that picture perfectly illustrates what it is. This happy looking pig in its muck. Happy in its muck. Will you walk through this world picking up all the muck and refuse to wash your feet? Or will you actually wash in the water of the word and let the word determine your walk? Remember the washing of the feet speaks of our walk being righteous. We are to be washed by the water of the word. That is, we are to walk according to the word. It's so many people don't want to, do they? They want to go back to wallowing in the mire. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth. To let the word determine your walk is what it means to be surrendered and to pick up your cross and follow Yeshua. To be like him. He was indeed the word made flesh. Then we walk in the word. And whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him truth his word is the truth but whoever keeps his word in him truly the love of God is perfected by this we may know that we are in him whoever says he abides in him or to walk in the same way in which he walked to walk according to the word and ask yourself the question will people get a sense of you Yeshua is from their encounters with you we're all supposed to be conformed to the image of his son Ask yourself, do you wash in the water of the word? The Lord of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yehovah is clean, enduring forever. The rules of Yehovah are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned in keeping them that is great reward. And the truth of these words is something that you can truly fully appreciate when you've had the experience of walking in his ways. Direct my steps by your word, but let not iniquity have dominion over me. I see people who do not have the word and I am all the more grateful for it. I see them all the time. Some of them look totally lost, totally depressed, but even people who think they're doing well and riding high, I look at them and I just feel so sorry for them. As we mentioned earlier, one of the benefits derived from the word of God is declared by Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 to be correction. Remember he said, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And Paul continues and he says, That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
the word equips us for every good work. And Yeshua said to us, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. To be a light to shine, we need the word to equip us. And we're called to be children of light. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And when I see people who don't have the word, I can see it. That is a darkness, isn't it? But where to walk as children of the light. The fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So walk as children of the light. The commandment is a lamp and the Lord is light. And reproofs are instruction of the way of life. Walk as children of the light is effectively saying walk according to the word. Because you are a chosen race again, you are a royal priesthood. You've been ordained, you've been washed, Luo. A holy nation of people for his own procession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who did what he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are priests ordained by being washed, fully immersed. Just like those in the tabernacle, we continue to wash ourselves. We are children of the light washed in the water of the word. Yeshua spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And to let the word determine your walk is what it means to be surrendered and to pick up your cross and follow Yeshua, as we've said. It speaks of having feet that are washed walking in paths of righteousness. It speaks of true repentance as opposed to someone who just wants to return to wallowing in the mire. It speaks of walking in the light, which is something that brings glory to Jehovah. This does not bring glory to Jehovah. But this is exactly where many folk are at. Often whilst going on about how great Jehovah is and how they love his word. And there they are wallowing in the mire. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You know what the truth is? To walk in darkness is to walk contrary to Jehovah's word, to refuse to wash. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, that is, in accordance with his word then we can be cleansed of all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So to walk in the light speaks of true repentance. It is these people who have their sins cleansed. Many may come and are cleansed, but they return to wallow and they are no longer clean. Indeed, their state is worse than if they'd known, uh, not known the way of righteousness. For those who have been washed, the call is to continually be cleansed by wash, uh, washing in the water of the word. And the call is to walk as children of the light. But so many go off for another wallow, just a little wallow. I'll just have another wallow. But we're called to purify ourselves. See, this is not the message of mainstream Christianity, which says, Christ did it all. Nothing required of you. Don't worry if you want to go back to the mire. If you want to go and continue on in sin. But we're to beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The Spirit expressly says that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And in 1 John 3, 10, uh, 3, 1 to 10, we read, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Why? Because we will have been conformed into the image of the Son. By doing what? By walking in the Word, just as he walks in the Word. And we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
And every man that has this hope in him does what? Purifies himself, even as he is pure. But whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law, and this is what so many people are quite comfortable with. You know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoever abides in him sins not. Whoever sins has not seen him, nor neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you, i.e. let nobody tickle your ears and tell you it's okay to go on sinning, walking contrary to Yelva's word, going back and wallowing in the mire. He that does righteousness, observe to do all these commandments before Yehovah our God, as he has commanded us, is righteous even as Yeshua is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. Whoever does not do righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. We know what righteousness is. It will be righteousness for us if we're careful to do all this commandment before Yehovah our God as he has commanded us. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. So Yehovah's children practice righteousness. That is, they walk according to the word. That is, they wash in the water of the word. And the effect of righteousness will be peace, shalom, and the result of righteousness, quietness and assurance, safety, security. When? Forever. Bekta, security, is related to Bicha, H985, which we see in this. In return, in, in repentance, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust and confidence shall be your strength. Those who've repented walk in righteousness that have washed, be washed in the water of the word and in this there is peace and there is security and this is something that the people in the world do not have so ask yourself will you purify yourself or are you set to go wallowing in the mire we are to wash in the water of the word we are to have feet that are cleansed that is we are to walk according to the word this means that we have truly repented this means that we have truly turned from walking our path to walking in paths of righteousness to let the word determine your walk is what it means to be surrendered and to pick up your cross and follow Yeshua will you do that? to be like him the word made flesh we walk in the word Yeshua said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? For what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. And then he says in Revelation, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Romans 14. It is written as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue confess, shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. What will your account be? Oh, sorry, I just wasn't interested. And oh, I just wanted to go back to wallowing in the mire. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And I always think, wouldn't it be good to hear these words? His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The whole idea of giving your life to Yeshua and then continuing to live a life that is not surrendered is something that Paul speaks about to those in Corinth. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. That's quite a remarkable statement, isn't it, from Paul? 
This is another good one for the once saved, always saved camp. He goes on and he says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moshe in the cloud and in the sea. So he's talking about the Red Sea crossing. Again, we have this picture of being washed. There's a picture of the ordination of the priest and there's a picture of us being baptized. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. But these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Which is a reference to the golden calf incident in Parsha. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. Which is a, the incident where on the advice of Balaam, the Moabites sent their women out to the Israelites to offer the men sexual favours if they would worship their God with them. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So these people were baptised into Moshe, washed as it were. Did it do them any good? No, not at all. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Paul is warning, he says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers. Our fathers were baptised, they were washed. But they didn't make it. They did not continue on walking in accordance with the word. And he's saying, don't be like them. A more comprehensive list of how the people went wrong. The people mourn after the loss of the things of Egypt, which is an idiom for the world. Then the golden calf incident, the sin of the spies. They're told they must die in the wilderness. They disobey and try to enter the land. Man gathers wood on the Sabbath and of Korah's rebellion. The people grumble about Korah being punished. The people speak about, speak about against Yehovah and this worthless food. And then we have the people whoring with Baal pure. But please note it all begins with complaining and hankering after the things of Egypt with wanting to go back to wallow in the mire rather than wanting to continue on in obedience but it gets so difficult at times to walk according to the word to have our feet washed to refuse to return to wallow in the mire it's so tempting it's so oh and my life it's so difficult you don't understand sometimes it's just too tough Paul continues and says, No temptation has overcome you, overtaken you, that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted or tried beyond your ability. With the temptation or trial, he will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. You are without excuse. If you go running off to wallow in the mire, it is because you desire to do it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. <clears throat> what is idolatry? Putting anything before Jehovah. Again, I'd say to you, if you've been going the wrong way, then turn. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom Jehovah counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. David says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to Jehovah, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Confessing is always meant to be accompanied by repentance. Proverbs 28. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. It's not just about saying sorry. Jehovah is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. And he says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. <coughs> Seek Jehovah while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He's coming back, isn't he? He'll stand before him one day. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to Jehovah that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways, declares Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. <clears throat> Stead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Stead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for Jehovah, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The Lord says, be careful to do all the words of this Torah. It is no empty word for you, but your very life. And since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Or as Peter puts it, the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Without spot or blemish, are ye washed in the water of the word? What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, he says as well. It is by living according to his word that we are sanctified, made holy, set apart. Indeed, Yeshua said, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. So after entering into the only gate and sacrificing at the brazen altar, the priest then proceeds to the holy place. Before he can minister or approach Jehovah, he must wash in the laver lest he die. And is the water the word that cleanses us and makes us holy? Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Be sanctified by the word. Please note, this washing in the water of the word as portrayed by the priest washing in the bronze laver is not some encouragement towards going through the motions, religious observance. Ooh, it's noon, it's time for me quick daily wash. I'll quickly read a chapter and then I'll be done. I've already read today's word for today. Oh, this is a long chapter. I'll just read up to verse 20. Yeshua says to us, you've been washed. You just need to take care of your feet. You just need to take care of your walk. You shall walk according to the word so that you may remain clean. Yeshua says the word will make you holy. When your lives are lived in accordance with the word, you will be set apart. And this has nothing to do with just reading a bit of the Bible every day. This has everything to do with looking into the mirror, seeing yourself as you truly are and applying the word to every aspect of your life so that you are without blemish or spot. This has everything to do with letting the word conform you to the image of Yeshua. And we're coming to a close, but we'll just read through the Shema. Hear, O Israel, Yehovah, our God, Yehovah is one. And you shall love Yehovah, your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, the things that you do, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, the things that you think about. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. They shall be an integral part of every aspect of your life. The grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of God endures forever. I wait for Jehovah, my soul does wait, and in his word I do hope. To wait, to bind yourself together with him. The word of Jehovah is amazing. And that's because Jehovah is amazing. I'll come back. Okay, key teaser part two. Right, at the start of part one we read... 
My son, do not despise Jehovah's discipline or be weary of his reproof. <laughs> For Jehovah reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. And this passage is quoted in Hebrews 12, 5 to 6. Now at the end of the part we read, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. <clears throat> now in chapter 32 of our Parsha we have the golden calf incident. And at the end of the chapter we read, Then Yehovah sent a plague on the people because they made the calf the one that Aaron made. And I ask myself, is this judgment or discipline? Well, for now, let's read more from Hebrews 12. We've kind of touched on the beginning and the end. So, Hebrews 12. Consider who, him who endured from sin is such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Peaceful fruit of righteousness. Looked at this before. The effect of righteousness will be peace. The result of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. In other words, finish the race just like Paul. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be not put out of joint, but rather be healed. In other words, walk in righteousness, walk with feet washed in the water of the word. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Be sanctified by the word. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. And when I read root of bitterness, it brings to mind wormwood. So... <laughs> We have all these verses exhorting us to walk in the word and then we have this warning about the root of bitterness. And it's interesting to see what scripture has to say about the root of bitterness. As I say, it brings to mind for me wormwood. Wormwood is associated with the desire to do away with Jehovah's law and follow one's own heart and instead worship false gods. Jeremiah 9. Jehovah said, Because they have forsaken my law which I set before them and have not obeyed, shimad my voice, neither walked therein. So they didn't walk in the word, but have walked after the imagination of their own hearts and after Baalim, which their fathers taught them after false gods. Therefore, thus says Jehovah Zavayot, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink. And in the end times prophecy, we read Revelation 8. The name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The third of the waters are infected with Wormwood, become Wormwood, what are the waters? Revelation 17, the angel said to me, The waters that you saw were the prostitutes are seated of peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. Well, you've got the world population of 6.9 billion. Christians who've forsaken the law, we've got a 2.3 billion. And we know what happened to the ten northern tribes who mixed worship of Jehovah with the worship of the pagan gods of the nations, which we've seen as a root of wormwood. Don't let this happen to you. Do not mix and mingle the Torah of Jehovah with humanistic philosophies, philosophies, with secular value systems, or with institutional forms of religious expression. If we go back to Hebrews 12, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. The language is quite keen, isn't it? Don't become defiled, don't become unclean. 
And no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing he was rejected for he found no place of repentance, no place of turning though he sought it carefully with tears. Repentance is not about feeling and expressing remorse as we've said. Esau was driven by his desires, the flesh, yet wanting the inheritance of those who were set apart, the holy. So from Hebrews 12, we have make straight paths for your feet. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God by going after false gods and forsaking the Torah. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Do not despise the discipline of Yehovah, for he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness that we might enjoy the, f the peaceful fruits of righteousness. Now, <clears throat> I learned an awful lot about discipline these past two weeks. Um, I'll be careful what I say because I'll be talking about my brother and I don't want to say too much. My brother <clears throat> likes to drink too much. I think he's finally realized that it's a problem. What this actually represents, after like days of real bad drinking, of um, his being abusive, being a danger to himself, um, he went out and I said to him, I said, if you come back, he was drunk even when he left, and I said, if you come back with drink or having drank more, then I will not let you in the house. And he went off. He was gone 40 minutes. It was a 10-minute walk to the shop and a 10-minute walk back, and in that time he managed to drink all this alcohol, not a bottle of whiskey. And he was already drunk. And I said to him, I told you what would happen, that you're not coming in. He was in such a state. <clears throat> I, he, was, he was absolutely out cold, stood up. When I opened the gates, he fell to the floor and I had to drag him. And he ended up here. Because I said to him when he left, if you come back having drank or with drink, I will not let you in the house. He was out cold. And so I put a sleeping bag on him, put a blanket under him, and put a duvet over him, and I put this big survival sheet over the top of him and give him some pillows. And that's the doorstep of our house. And then I locked the door. And obviously, he come round many hours later and was abusive because I wouldn't let him in the house. Um, things got quite bad. Um, the next day, I drove him to an ex-girlfriend's visit. She wouldn't have him in the house, but she gave him money and he went off and he got drunk again and then he came back and the abuse started again. But I told him, while you're drinking, you cannot come in the house. And I was so clear about it. And through all this process, all this, I'm just thinking about how it is with Yehovah when he speaks to us and how we behave and how he must feel. Um, when he says, if you do this, this will happen. And we do it anyway. And then when the consequences come, we're just so like, what? What are you doing? And I was, I was doing it for his good. Because he always just gets away with it and there's no real consequences. And I wanted him to realize this is where you're headed if you carry on living like this. At some point, he will inevitably end up with nothing. And for his own good, I wanted him to taste that. We went out that day, another day. He was, 
was going to stay at this girl's and she wouldn't have him and then he had to come back and he was annoyed because he was trying to get friends to have him stay and I had to lend him my own phone so he could phone them up and tell them how much he thought of me on my phone and asked him if he could stay and he couldn't so he ended up back here again and I am um, it was cold as well and I was inside in the house and the door was locked and I knew he needed drink to come down so I, well, no, I'm not cruel so I gave him some alcohol and he'd lost everything and he had nothing and I knew he smoked so I gave him some cigarettes and then I went upstairs and I had the rest of the cigarettes and I had access to beer loads of it and I have money and he had none and I was upstairs and I just it was so difficult I had all this power over him and I was I, I said to the Lord I don't want this, I don't like this I don't like this this feeling I, like I've got this, these cigarettes and I'm going to give him it just felt horrible and he's outside and I know he's cold and he's suffering and I hated every second of it and I cried because it felt so horrible but I knew it was for his own good but it was so difficult and I went down to check on him and um, he's kind of sobered up a little tiny bit and this also, there's so much I learned in what he said and how I felt when he said it. He'd been giving me abuse, I mean, filthy, horrible abuse for like a long time, like a week and a half. And then he said, as he's outside and I'm about to lock the door again and I'm about to lock him out again. He said, well... I can see that you don't want me to suffer. And I got real comfort in that. And then he said something else which is quite remarkable. He said, maybe this is for my own good. And I thought, wow. I know how that made me feel. How must it make the Lord feel when he disciplines us? And it's so difficult for him because he loves us so much. But he wants what's good for her. And we turn around and we acknowledge to him, rather than being abusive and, why is this what? And we acknowledge to him, Lord, I know that you mean me no harm. And maybe this is for my own good. And I thought of all the times in my life when I treated Jehovah like my brother was treating me I thought of how much he must have hurt when he punished me and how amazing it must have been for him when I finally surrendered to him and apologised I learned so much about how difficult it is to love somebody in that way. I thought of having all this power and control and I thought of Yale Vah who's got ultimate power and control and how much it must hurt him and all he wants to do they see us well. All he wants to do is reach out and bless us. All he wants to do is open the door and welcome us in. So I thank you, Hova, for the lesson that I learned in it. I thank you, Hova, that I learned even more about how much he loves us. 
how much he's loved me in my life. How much we can delight him when we actually turn. When we acknowledge our wrong. When we thank him. When he punishes us and we know it's for his own good and we acknowledge it. I thank him for the way that he loves us. And I understand how much it must hurt him. In a way that I never ever could before. He is incredible. <laughs> Even more incredible than I ever thought before. Bless your holy name. <laughs> Jehovah. Thank you. Thank you for all the discipline that you've put me through in my life. Thank you for loving me the way that you have. Amen. Amen. So, I learned about how it feels to be a disciplinarian and how incredibly difficult it is and how much it hurts you. I can say a lot about how wonderful our Elohim is, about how much pain we cause him when we go off the rails. And then I read passages like this and it makes so much more sense to me. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Jehovah has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its own and the donkey, donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Our sinful nation of people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, Children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken Yehovah. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. And then I looked at my brother continually just abusing himself. The question was, why? Why? I can see so many parallels. Your country lies desolate, your cities are burned with fire, in your very presence foreigners devour your land, it is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. The daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If Yehovah and Zavayot had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of Yehovah, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says Yehovah. I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. And again, I see a parallel with my brother when he would say the things he thought I wanted to hear at times. When you come to appear before me, who is required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings, incense, and abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity in solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They've become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen to your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes and cease to do evil. I can hear in it now a real hurt. But I couldn't hear before. And in it, this real desire for the best for these people. Cease to do evil, repent. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's course. Walk in accordance with my word. Come now. 
It's just a walk, come. Let us reason together. Says Yehovah, though your sins be uh, like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. This word there is actually to correct, to reprove, to chasten. You can see how it's used in scripture. So the Lord says, walk to me, let me reprove you, chastise you, correct you. Why? That you might be clean. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Things will go well for you. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of Jehovah has spoken. How the faithful city has become a whore. She who was full of justice, righteousness, lodged in her, but now murderous. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bride and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless and the widow's cause does not come to them. Therefore the Lord declares, Jehovah Zavayot, the mighty one of Israel, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you and smelt away your dross as with lie and remove you, all your alloy. And I will restore your judges as at the first and your counsellors at the beginning, after which you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by justice, and those in her who repent by righteousness. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together, and those who forsake Jehovah shall be consumed. Jehovah wants his people to repent. He says, continue on in this way. Look what will become of you. Why would you do this? Wash yourselves. For if you return to Jehovah, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return to this land. For Jehovah, your God, is gracious. He's merciful. And he will not turn away his face from you if you return to him, if you repent. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Why are you doing this? I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn, repent, and live. Can you hear how much it must hurt him? The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises from count slowness. He is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Turn and live. Always the message is repent. After talking of the great and terrible day of Jehovah, we read in Joel, Yet even now, declares Jehovah, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to Jehovah your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in kindness and steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. In Psalm 103, as the Father shows compassion to his children, so Jehovah shows compassion to those who fear him. The word is Racham. To love deeply and have mercy, have tender affection. This word, James, shares the same root as Rechem, which is the Hebrew word for womb. You can hear how Jehovah feels in these words. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. In all the troubles that come to his people, we see Jehovah as teacher wanting his people to learn to run to him. As we read later on in Isaiah, in Isaiah 30. Though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore, but your eyes shall see your teacher. 
Your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, then you will defile your carved idols overlaid with silver and your gold-plated matte images. You will scatter them as unclean things and say to them, be gone. And the passage continues with the blessings that will then come. To the church in Laodicea, you say I am rich, I have prospered and I have need of nothing, not realising that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may be rich, white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Fire, behold I've refined you but not as silver, I've refined you in the fairness of affliction. The fire that it talks about is this fire of affliction. And he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The fire, the great tribulation. By gold refined in the fire, repent. Those I love, I reprove and discipline, repent. And of course, a great multitude that nobody can mention from every nation will be clothed in white. They will have repented. These are the ones coming out of the fire. Those who have been beheaded for the testimony of Yeshua and the word of God. For many who go through the tribulation, we see that Yehovah's discipline brings repentance and life. The punishments of Yehovah are the actions of a loving father. Proverbs 1. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn, if you repent at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Here we see discipline. Discipline leads to repentance. But for those who refuse to repent at Yehovah's reproof, we see judgment. Because I called and you refused to listen and stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you've ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, none of my discipline. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm, your calamity comes like a whirlwind when distress and anguish come upon you. And they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but not find me. Many people will be disciplined by the Lord, but they will not repent. And they'll continue on and they'll think it's all great. Oh, he still loves me because look, all this rubbish is still going on. Foolish. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Jehovah, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have the fill of their own devices. Indeed, in Amos 9, behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes with a sieve, but not one pebble shall fall to the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say disaster shall not overtake us or meet us. The discipline of the Lord is to bring you to repentance. The simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me, Shemaz, walks in my ways, walks in my word, will dwell secure, will be at ease without dread of disaster. But so many do not listen. They will not turn in repentance. They are not humble before Yehovah. Indeed, they are arrogant enough to think that everything will be well with them, even though they walk in transgression of his ways. And they say, disaster won't overtake our meters. Maybe once they were washed, but they have not walked righteously. They have not washed at the bronze laver, but rather have gone back to wallow in the mire. And Romans 2 says this, Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Because of your hard and impertinent and hard, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. So those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honour and mortality will give eternal life. And for those who are self-seeking, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And God shows no partiality. And they say, Yehovah does not see. The God of Jacob does not perceive. 
Understand, O dullest of the people, fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge. Jehovah knows the thoughts of man, that they are but a breath. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Jehovah, and whom you teach out of your law. If you turn at my reproof, Behold, I will pour out my spirit to you, and I will make my words known to you. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Yehovah, and whom you teach out of your law. A wise man fears and departs from evil, but the fool rages as confident. If we move on to Exodus 32 and the golden calf incident now. When the people saw that Moshe delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aharon and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moshe, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. All the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears, and they brought them to Aaron. And we received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation, and he said what? He said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to Jehovah. The world is full of religion. The world of religion, rather, is full of people doing their own thing. So many building their own little golden calf, building their own golden calf and ascribing Yehovah's name to it as Aaron just did then. In Ephesians 5, 6, it says this, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Consider the second word in Exodus 20. Shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, Jehovah, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But show in steadfast love, has said, sometimes kindness, sometimes mercy, to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Those who do this hate me, says the Lord. And those who love me keep my commandments. And these shall know my steadfast love, my mercy, my hesed. Daniel knew this, which is why he begins his prayer in Daniel 9. I pray to Yelvah, my God, and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, mercy, hesed, with those who love him and keep his commandments. Well, according to the second word, those who go after false gods hate Yehovah. And those who hate him do not keep his commandments. And this is a quote from Paul Washett. He says this, If I preach the classical Christian view of who God is in your church, it won't take long for some of your finest members, especially among the elderly and especially among the women, will walk out of that church with their teeth clenched together and say, my God's not that way. I could never love a God like that. Because the God they've been worshipping is not the God of the Bible, it's a figment of their own imagination. A God they've made with their mind and they were, then they worshipped what they had made and he looks more like Santa Claus than he does Yahweh. And I would not doubt there are people here and you don't like him. You wouldn't like him if you knew him. So, how can you be sure that you haven't fallen into idolatry? Fourteen times in the concluding chapters of Exodus, the narrative will repeat the following words. Ka'asher tiva Yehovah Moshe. Exactly as Yehovah instructed Moshe who represents the Torah and the Word. This is the exact opposite of fashioning a God for yourself. But there are so many who do not want to do exactly as Yehovah instructed Moshe. They do not want to walk according to the Word. And even when the Lord rebukes them and reproves them, they don't want none of it. Thus says Jehovah, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. And they said, we will not walk in it. 
Okay, not interested in having clean feet and walking in paths of righteousness, walking according to the word. We're called to wash our feet. That is, we're called to walk according to the word. They said we will not walk in it. And today so many say the same thing. It seems Jehovah's people haven't changed. We looked at the list of how the people went wrong before. The people mourn after the loss of the things of Egypt, the golden calf incident, the sin of the spies, and jumping ahead and ended with the people whoring with Baal pure. All speaks of idolatry, all speaks of lack of faith, but it all begins with desiring the things of Egypt, which represents wanting to go back to that which they were once in bondage to, namely the world and sin. speaks of wanting to wallow in the mire rather than wanting to continue on in obedience for those who do not walk according to the word for those who do not love the word which is described as we saw earlier as the truth in Psalm 119 the mystery of lawlessness is already at work only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way that's a reference to the Roman Empire then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Yeshua will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Why are they perishing? Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. In order that all may be condemned, he did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Disobedience is unbelief, obedience is belief. Loving the truth is believing the truth and believing the truth is obeying the truth. To love the truth is to obey the truth and that it is those that love the truth that will be saved. The Lord says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In Psalm 48, we see, I delight to do your will, O my God, your Torah is within my heart. What's the Torah? The truth is in my heart. It is my desire to do the Torah. I love the truth. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? These people are deluded. Lord, it's us, it's us. He declares to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, anomia. You who work without law, you who live your lives not in accordance with my word. We read it before. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. To walk in the darkness is not practicing the truth, the Torah. To walk in the light is to practice the truth, the Torah. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It is those who walk in the light, practice the Torah, that are cleansed from all sin. We read before. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. The root of bitterness, where is associated with the desire to do away with Yehovah's law, the truth, anomia, and follow one's own heart instead and worship false gods, golden calves as it were. That's why the true Messiah turns around and says, I never knew you. Because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. Lord, Lord, it is us, they cry. The end times. The name of the star is called Wormwood and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. Many men died because of the waters. They were made bitter. They desired to do away with Jehovah's truth. Anomia and worship and follow false gods. Gods of their own making golden calves. Because why? Because they refuse to love the truth. And so be saved. Of course, the Torah is the way, the Torah is the truth, the Torah is the life. Yeshua actually said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But they refused to love the truth. Yeshua was the word made flesh. And Yeshua made the following statement, If you will love me, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And it's not that we do his commandments to demonstrate that we love him. It's not a case of, oh, go on, just to show I love you. We keep his commandments because we love them and because they are who he is 
when we keep his commandments it's a demonstration of how much we love him those who love not the truth the Torah the word that they might be saved do not love Yeshua and have made for themselves a golden calf you can't say you love Yeshua and yet have a problem keeping his commandments the commandments all speak of who he is those who love him are drawn to keep the commandments and they are not a burden as we read in 1 John 5 this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome keeping the commandments is the most natural thing for someone who loves God to do if we tr struggle to keep Shema to watch over be protective of God vigorously his commandments it's because we do not love him the many have molded themselves of God the many are under a great delusion they don't know that they don't know that they are but if they did know it wouldn't be much of a delusion would it the problem is that they do not love the truth this has nothing to do with whether you call yourself a Torah keeper or not by the way to love the truth, to believe the truth, to believe the truth is to obey the truth. And it's got nothing to do with how much Bible study you do either. This is about what is in your heart. If you don't love the truth and you take pleasure in unrighteousness, then of course you're going to fashion a God for yourself. And deluded you will believe that this is the God of Scripture. Lord, Lord, it is us. Remember they cry. If you don't love the truth, of course you're going to want to accept empty words that suit your passions. You've made a golden calf that you think will save you. You'll even be convinced that it's okay to continue on in iniquity and that everything will be fine. As we read before, disaster shall not overtake us or meet us. Now Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moshe delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said, up make us gods who shall go before us as for this motion the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt we do not know what has become of him so Aaron said take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives your sons your daughters and bring them to me so all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron Yehovah gave Moshe instructions for taking a free will offering to be used in making the tabernacle we read that in Exodus 25 here Aaron received a collection, an offering of gold to make an idol. And the commentary by Guzik says, By nature, people are generous in what they give to their idols. And I know that to be a fact. I was at my auntie's funeral yesterday and I mentioned that I was coming to church. And one of my, my cousin said, I'm going to my church tomorrow too. And he meant Anfield, the place where Liverpool football team play. And indeed, he's one of those people who will spend absolute fortunes to travel the world to go and watch his football team and think nothing of it because he is generous in what he gives to his idols just as these people were. Most people in the world fashion gods for themselves or turn to the gods and idols that they are presented with in the culture they grow up in. In the modern day, they don't even realise that this is what they are doing, most of them anyway nothing has really changed it's always been the same silver and gold i.e the things that a materialistic world holds valuable being turned into something for people to offer their devotion to it says and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden or molten calf and they said these are your gods O israel who brought you up out of the land of egypt when aaron saw this he built an altar before it and aaron made a proclamation and said tomorrow shall be a feast to Yehovah." They rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and they rose up to play. Okay. Um, and we're going to go back to this in 1 Corinthians now. These things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So we're reading about this and these are examples for us. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as is written, the people sat down, uh, sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So this is this, what we're talking about now, is the golden calf incident. And then it says, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. Now, at the beginning of part two, I asked the question, at the end of chapter 32 we read, then Yehovah sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. I said, is it judgment or discipline? This incident mentioned in verse 8 here about the sexual immorality and Baal pure incident tells us much about the answer to that. 
It says that in this plague, 20, well, it says 4,000 died there. The book of Numbers, there are two censuses, one in chapter 1 taken in the second year from the Exodus and another one in chapter 26 taken 38 years later, just before the Israelites were to enter the land of Canaan. These two censuses reveal that the tribe of Simeon decreased in number significantly. They're by suggestion that the ones that were hit hardest by the plague. And from the account of the incident which involved the son of the leader from the tribe of Simeon, we can see why this might be the case, especially when we consider what Yehovah says in Deuteronomy 4. He says, Your eyes have seen what Yehovah did at Baal pure, for Yehovah your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of pure. But you who held fast to Yehovah your God are all alive today. Yehovah brings judgments on the Midianites soon after this, who were involved in this incident of dragging the... Um, the Israelites into idolatry. But as we see here, judgment begins at the house of God. Judgment for those who would go after other gods and encourage Jehovah's people to become idolaters and whores. Remember, Paul spoke of those who encourage Jehovah's people to become idolaters. He said, As I've said before, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. I believe that after the plague that followed the golden calf incident, the same could be said as is written in Deuteronomy 4. But you who held fast to Jehovah your God are all alive today. And we know that Aharon, who was involved, was only spared due to Moshe's intercession. Now, whereas I may be thankful for the chastisement of a loving Elohim, I do not want to know the wrath of his judgment. And remember, the world of religion is full of people doing their own thing. So many building their own little golden calf, building their own golden calf and ascribing Yehovah's name to it. What we read here, let no one deceive you with empty words, but because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. I do not want to know the wrath of Yehovah. I am grateful for his discipline, for his love. I do not want to incur the wrath of Yehovah. I certainly don't want to do it by going after a false idea of who Yehovah is. The only way I can know that I am following him and walking with him is if I walk according to his word. Now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So don't get confused. If you're living in rebellion to Yehovah and his word, then don't, make, don't mistake the curses that come for a seal of approval that he still loves you. His reproof should lead to repentance. If you turn, if you repent at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you and make my words known to you. A wise man fears and departs from his evil. The fool rages as in confidence. Let's look again at the first verse of chapter 32 to see if we can learn anything from it. The people saw that Moshe delayed coming down from the mountain. The people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And the Hebrew word for delayed is a term that actually implies that Moshe had disappointed them. They had their own ideas of how long he should be up there on the mountain. Remember, Moshe is an idiom for the Torah. And you ask yourself, how many Torah keepers get disappointed by Moshe, get disappointed by the Torah? They need something else. They need to add their own take or find a new focus. It's just not enough, is it? It's like, oh, what's the new thing? What's the new fad? What's the new doctrine? What's this new thing? They end up discontent and bickering and investing themselves in whatever diversion takes their fancy. They bring the gold earrings, as it were. Hey, presto, they end up with a golden calf and they ascribe Yehovah's name to it. They're mad keen, they rise up early to play and make a lot of noise and inevitably attract other people who perhaps are also a little bit disappointed in Moshe in the Torah and looking for something new, the next fix. And what they end up with is worthless. You yourself, like living stones, are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua HaMashiach. 
So we are supposed to be built up together to bring spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to Jehovah. What is acceptable to Jehovah is that which is prescribed in his word. I ask you, are you disappointed in his word? The rabble that was among them had a strong craving and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions and the garlic. All the things of Egypt. Oh, we wish we could go back and wallow in the mire. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. In other words, this manna is not enough for us. What does the manna represent? It represents the bread from heaven, the word of Jehovah. And things get even worse with those who begin with dissatisfaction, with wanting more. In Numbers 21 we read, And the people spoke against God and against Moshe, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water. We loathe this worthless food. So it begins with a dissatisfaction, with wanting more. Let's have something else. And ends with this, we loathe this worthless food. So ask yourself, is the manna enough for you? If so, will you wash in it? That is, will you walk in accordance with what it says, with all that it says? Will you be sanctified by it? Yeshua says to us, you've been washed. You just need to take care of your feet. You just need to take care of your walk. You shall walk according to the word so that you re may remain clean. Yeshua says the word will make you holy. When your lives are lived in accordance with the word, you will be set apart. As we said before, this has nothing to do with just reading a bit of the Bible every day. This has everything to do with looking into the mirror, seeing yourself as you truly are, and applying the word to every aspect of your life so that you are without blemish or spot. This has everything to do with letting the word conform you to the image of Yeshua. Grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God endures forever. I wait for Jehovah, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. Bind yourself to him. Hope in his word. The word of Jehovah is amazing. That's because Jehovah is amazing. And I realised that more this week than I did last week. Thank you, Jehovah. And if he disciplines you, repent. And acknowledge you're wrong. I know that it hurts him because he loves you so much. Bless you, Lord. I'll come back in a minute. The Lord said to Moshe, Go down, go, sorry, get thee down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, These be thy gods of Israel which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moshe, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath might wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I'll make of thee a great nation. So he could be thinking, so if I don't leave you alone, you wouldn't do it. Now, Jehovah is doing this because he wants Moshe to grow. He wants Moshe to see the opportunity to forsake the Israelites and become the progenitor of the bloodline and to decide against it. There's something about Moshe actually making a decision that is different to knowing that he would have made that decision. It will develop him spiritually. And Jehovah will often lead us through events that grow us spiritually. And um, we mentioned earlier about things that might come in your life, tests and trials. And we said about the fact that the Lord will always make a way for you. And that's not to say that things will be easy. Things might be difficult in your life. And these tests might be difficult. But Jehovah says there is always a way and he is with us. And we know all things work for the good of those who love the Lord. He will often do things that will grow us. So I just thought I'd point that out. Moshe besought Jehovah his God and he said, Lord, why does your wrath wax hot against thy people which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? So you might think that's a bizarre question, isn't it obvious? But there are two different forms of why. There's an inquiry about the causality of a situation. Why has this happened? What caused it? 
and why future tense, as in for what purpose, what would this achieve? Moshe is not saying, why are you mad at these people? He's not saying, oh, come on, they were only having a bit of fun. Moshe gets how awful it is, and he makes a plea for grace. He says, why should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Yitzhak, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thy own self, and said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. So this is a man who knew the character of Yehovah, and he appeals on the basis of three things that Yehovah has said or will say. Yehovah's promises of salvation, Yehovah's name being profaned among the nations, and Yehovah's word to the patriarchs. Moshe calls on the name or the character of Yehovah. Again, Yehovah knew what the outcome would be. He was teaching Moshe through these events about who he is. Vinyachem Yehovah al Ra'ah. The Lord repented Nacham of the evil which he thought to do unto this people. Okay, Nacham, the Hebrew verb that forms the verb root of Yinachem, does not mean or imply repentance or changing. Nacham means to have compassion or to give comfort or to be consoled. Obviously related to the word we looked at before, Racham. Moshe returns with Joshua to the camp. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moshe's anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables of his hands and he broke them beneath the mount. And Moshe said to Aharon, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And we have the worst excuse ever. Aharon said to them, Whosoever hath any gold... Aaron says, I said to them, whosoever have any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me and I cast it into the fire and there came out this calf. So like, oh, okay then. <laughs> but obviously we'd read it before. He received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Oh, it just kind of happened. Oh, I don't know. I don't know how it happened. There might be a case for this has been badly translated because that is just ridiculous. <laughs> Who's wrong with them? But then again, I don't know. There are people who have ridiculous excuses for all kinds of things and behaviours in their life. Aaron's sin was so great that, as mentioned earlier, only the intercession of Moshe saved his life. Indeed, in Deuteronomy 9 we read, Yehovah was ang very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him, so I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. And when Moshe saw the people were naked, unrestrained, for Aaron had made them naked, for Aaron had not restrained them unto their shame among their enemies. Okay, this is not good, is it? There is no greater danger than for the people to cast off all restraint and do whatever seems right in their own eyes. In fact, the darkest days of Israel's history were characterized by the phrase from Judges, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Proverbs 14 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We're told, aren't we? Trust in Yehovah with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, every aspect of your life and all the things that you do, and he will make straight your paths. But most people refuse to be humble before Yehovah. They want to do things their own way. And they want a God that lets them do it their own way. William Bullock Sr. said something that was quite cool. Truth that is, the truth is that there is something about fallen man that will always, if given a choice, choose a God he can mould himself according to his own tastes. Such a God, you see, man can manipulate and control. To such a God, man is not in any meaningful way accountable. Such a God is always easier to serve than Yehovah, whom we cannot control or manipulate, and to whom we are accountable for every thought, attitude, opinion, word, and deed. A handmade God is therefore to the basic instincts of man much more palatable than the true God. A calf God is, after all, a much more convenient God. A calf God that can be served any way we want, any time we want, if we want. A calf God lets us hold meetings that are all about us and what we like, and we can call it worship. 
A calf God does not confront us over lukewarmness or complacency and does not discipline us when we neglect our calling. Okay. For Moshe stood in the gate of the camp and he said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Please note that Aaron and his sons had already been chosen to be priests. Their appointment has nothing to do with the golden calf sin. After all, he was credited with making the calf. We read it just before. Before the golden calf incident, we've read, Bring near to you Aaron and his brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aharon and Aharon's sons, Nadav and Abihu, Eliata and Ithama. Because people make out, don't they, that it's because of this episode that they got to be priests. That is totally not the case according to scripture and the children of Levi did according to the word of Moshe and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men for Moshe has said consecrate yourselves today to the Lord even every man upon his son and upon his brother that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day and we'll just have a quick look at this for Moshe had said consecrate and this is the word in Hebrew male yourselves to, today to the Lord Okay, and it's to fill, to be full of, you can see all these ideas of it, yeah, fullness, abundance, to be full. The word translated consecrate means to fill or to be full. The call here from Moshe is to be fully for Yehovah. This is not to do with being consecrated to be priests. This is just be fully for Yehovah. And it's interesting, isn't it? The 3,000 that fell matched by what we see at Shavuot in the first century. With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. That's really significant, isn't it? Because what these people have done with regards to the golden calf is basically idolatry. And what we have happening at Shavuot is the bringing back of the house of Israel who had been divorced, who had been sent away out of covenant because of what? Because of idolatry. And here we see at this time here in Acts 2 we see that the Lord has made a way. He cleansed the temples of these people who would set up idols in their own hearts and made a way for them to come back into covenant matched in the 3,000 that fell at this incident of the golden calf with what happened at Pentecost Shavuot in Acts 2. It came to pass on the morrow that Moshe said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moshe returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, have made them God, God, gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin and not blot me, I pray thee, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Okay, so an incredible prayer. If you won't forgive them, blot me out of your book. Revelation 20. I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So, not a good thing to be blotted out of the book. But the Lord said to Moshe, Whoever had sinned against me, him I will blot out of my book. In Revelation we read this, Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So, if we want to be considered worthy and not have our names blotted out of the book of life, then we must keep our garments clean and not sin against Jehovah. We receive priestly garments when we come in repentance, when we are washed in the waters of a baptism, which as we've seen is an appeal for a clean conscience. Just as Aharon and his son received their garments when they were washed, Exodus 40. Thou shalt bring Aharon and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash. And this is that word again, isn't it? Luo, to be fully immersed, then with water. 
and put on Aaron the holy garments, and you shall anoint him and consecrate him, that he may serve me as a priest. You shall also bring his sons and put coats on them, and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priests. And as royal priests, called to bring spiritual sacrifices, we also receive garments when we are washed, and we must keep our garments clean. The garments we are to keep clean are described as the garments of salvation and our robes of righteousness. In Isaiah 61, I will greatly rejoice in Jehovah, my soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. We read in Jude, Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by what? By the flesh. It's by walking after the flesh we defile our garments. And to walk after the flesh is what Romans 8 says, because the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is enmity against God. Why? Because it is not subject to the Lord of God, to walking in the ways of God, to being washed in the water of the word. Neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Not walking in accordance with the word, not submitting to the law, the truth of Jehovah causes us to be defiled. How do we stay clean? By doing righteousness. That is, by walking according to the word. We read it before. That he, Yeshua, might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. What is righteousness? It is walking in Jehovah's ways. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness and let thy saints shout for joy. If we continue to sin, all we do is defile ourselves the same message all the way through scripture it takes us right back to where we started today when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn a food offering to Jehovah they shall wash with water so that they may not die they shall wash their hands and their feet so they may not die it shall be a statute forever to them even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations the bronze laver speaks to us of being washed in the water of the world because why because we're to be found without blemish or spot there you go, washed by the water of the word, to be found without spot or wrinkle, to be holy and without blemish. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Yeshua said, he that is washed, luo, like those priests who were washed, and then they were put on their garments. Need not to save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are all clean, but not all. There it is, the whole full immersion that we see that the priests go through but we wash our feet we wash in the water of the word the Lord said to him whoever has sinned against me him I will blot out of my book whoever has defiled themselves therefore now go lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee behold mine angels shall go before thee nevertheless in the day when I visit I will visit their sin upon them the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. The Lord said to Moshe, depart and go up hence thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear to Abraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov, saying unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusite, Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey for I will not go up in the midst of thee for thou art a stiff-necked people lest I consume thee in the way. When the people heard these evil tidings they mourned and no man did put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moshe, say to the children of Israel you are a stiff-necked people I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do to thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. Jehovah speaks words of discipline to them, and what do they do? They take off their garment, these, these ornaments. They repent. We have repentance. What we refer to as teshuva, from shuv to turn. Acts 26, 
Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God. Please note what it says then. Performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. This is not about what you say. It's actually about what you do. Repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Repentance doesn't mean anything if you keep doing what you say you're sorry for. Modern Christian repentance is just about saying sorry. It is not to shuva. I know this because I used to go to Christian churches. And Matthew 3, 8, the words from John the Baptist, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And I'm excited to say that next week JP's going to be talking all about fruit and the fruit of the Spirit. Um, it should be a good teaching, so I'd, I'd um, encourage you to make an effort to, to see it. Most of what passes as repentance has nothing to do with Yehovah. The modern Western world concept of repentance has little to do with dying to self and turning to Yehovah to walk in his ways. It has more to do with making the fit person feel better by relieving his or her feelings of guilt. I've seen great outpourings. Oh, I'm so sorry. And loads of tears and all this and big demonstrations. Only to know that the person has continued in exactly the same way that they always did. True repentance or teshuva is sometimes far beyond. It's something rather far beyond and much deeper than sorry. It is unconditionally surrendered to Yehovah. And an essential final step of it, therefore, is actually facing the exact same temptation to which you yielded before, and this time making a different decision, the covenant consistent decision. By stripping themselves of the gold, uh, golden rings and jewellery their neighbours had so recently used to make unto themselves a golden calf, the remnant returned precisely to the place where they had sinned in stripping off their gold in order to make a god. And then Moshe intercedes for the people and makes a request. Moshe said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name. Jehovah, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. We'll have a look at that in a minute because it's not arbitrary. But he said, you cannot see my face for man that shall not see me and live. And what he's talking about there is this. I prayed to Jehovah my God and made confession saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God. He says, I will have mercy with whom I will have mercy. He shows mercy to those who love him and keep his commandments. And Yehovah said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. You shall see my back, Akawa, or Echev, hereafter from Echev. It refers to the heel of a foot. And the use here in the Torah is an idiom or a figurative way of saying on the heels of, which is an English idiom for following or as a result of the consequence or the reward. Moshe wants to see Yehovah's glory and he gets to see his back parts. And the word speaks of that which is to come as a result of. So Moshe gets to see the glory of Yehovah that will come on the heels of. And he says to him, doesn't he? He says, you should stand on the rock. Moshe stands on the rock and sees the glory of Yehovah. What is the rock? Paul tells us the rock was Messiah in 1 Corinthians 10.4. How can we stand upon the rock? Yeshua tells us exactly how to stand on the rock. By shimaring, listening to, asaring, building our lives as with it, the Torah that he taught us. In fact, in Matthew 7, we can read it. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And Yehovah said to Moshe, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to the Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moshe cut two tablets of stone like the first and he rose early in the morning and he went up on Mount Sinai 
as Jehovah had commanded him, and he took in his hand two tablets of stone. We've looked in the past at the word for stone, a ben, where it's an aleph, which is representative of the leader, Jehovah, followed by ben, which means son. Two tablets of stone, the son of the father. And Moshe had made haste and bowed his head towards the earth, and he worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and sin, and take, take us for thine inheritance. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Hebraic thought one's Shem name is much, much more than the name or title by which one is called. To the Hebrew mind, Shem is a description of the very essence of a person. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, because he's just and righteous. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. Jehovah, though he wants us to know him as merciful and gracious and slow to anger. He wants us to know him as forgiving and faithful and just and careful to give opportunity for teshuva. By no means pardons the guilty though, those who refuse to listen. But will you listen? If you've strayed, then turn and run to him. Submit to him. True repentance, not lip service. If you've been going the wrong way, then turn and he will welcome you. Come to Yehovah in true repentance and know how merciful he is. Know his chesed, that's the Hebrew word translated as mercy and kindness. Be washed, be fully immersed. Ready for your priestly garments, your robes of righteousness. Ready to minister and to draw near to Yehovah. And if your repentance is true and you have turned from all the wrong, then you will walk in the word. Your feet will be clean, you will visit the bronze laver, you will wash in the water of the word and you will be counted as his. And wouldn't it be good to hear these words? His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I can't even begin to imagine. In fact, this verse comes to mind. As it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. The psalmist says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand the pleasures forevermore. For those who have been washed, the call is to continually cleanse by being washed in the water of the word. That is not the message of mainstream Christianity which says, Christ did it all, nothing required of you, don't worry if you want to go back to the mire, if you want to continue on in sin. At the end of Parshakitiza, we see a call not to follow after other gods. That includes following after Messiah who doesn't call you to be spotless and holy. It says, Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall worship no other god for Jehovah, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. We've looked at this before, that the Jesus of mainstream Christianity is another god, a golden calf. We're not to go after him. He lets you indulge your flesh which defiles your garments and he tells you it's okay. He's taken great chunks of Yehovah's word and thrown it out and made it obsolete. He's unhappy to incorporate pagan practices of worship. Deuteronomy 6 says, It is Yehovah, your God, you shall fear. Him you shall serve. 
and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. Deuteronomy 13, you shall walk after Yehovah your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and you shall cling to him. And when Joshua is addressing Israel, he made it clear what it means to cling to Yehovah. Joshua 23, therefore be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moshe, turning aside from it neither to the left hand nor to the right, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, and the names of their gods shall not be named among you, neither shall you serve them or bow down to them, but you shall cling to Jehovah your God just as you have done to this day. And in Psalm 95 we read, O come, let us sing to Jehovah, let us make a joyful no noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For Jehovah is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Jehovah our Maker. Let us be surrendered before him. For he is our God and we are the sheep of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah as on the day at Massar in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. And as we read before, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Please note. That always are those who claim to follow the same Elohim as us, yet do not tremble at his word. You'll meet many of them. In Isaiah 66, 5, Hear the word of Jehovah, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. But it is they who shall be put to shame. This tells us Jehovah will deal with them. And it also says, they may hate us, but we are to regard them as brothers. This is not about having an excuse to look down your noses. But it does say in this psalm that we read today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Jehovah is merciful, he's gracious, he's slow to anger, forgiving and faithful and just and careful to give opportunity for Teshuvah. If you've strayed, then turn, run to him. Because in return and rest you shall be saved in quietness and in trust, which is related to the same word, security, safety, that will be your strength. All these things that the world craves after but can't find. And for all who have turned to Yehovah, if it is necessary and he rebukes and chastises you, then do not despise it. Repent and be grateful that you have such a loving Elohim and cling to him. Yeshua says to you, you've been washed. You just need to take care of your feet. You just need to take care of your walk. You shall walk according to the word so that you may remain clean. Yeshua says the word will make you holy. When your lives are lived in accordance with the word, you will be set apart. Nothing to do with just reading a bit of the Bible every day. Everything to do with looking into the mirror, seeing yourself as you truly are and applying the word to every aspect of your life so that you're without blemish or spot. It has everything to do with letting the word conform you to the image of Yeshua. The grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of God endures forever. I will wait for Jehovah, my soul does wait, and in his words, I do hope. I am bound to him. I cling to him. The word of Jehovah is amazing. And that's because Jehovah 
is amazing. Yeah. Should we pray? Heavenly Father, I pray for all people who might hear this who have not turned to you. I pray, Lord, that they would. I pray that you would speak to them through your word. I pray, Lord, that all people through your word would see themselves just as they are. And that they would desire to be clean. I pray for all the people, Lord, who are living in sin, that they would understand what it does to you and how much it hurts you. People who have sin in their lives and are refusing to hearken to your discipline, to your words. And Lord, I thank you for the way in which you love us. Lord, and I can hear in your words so much clearer now your desire to want good for your people. How much it hurts you, so I ask you, Heavenly Father, for forgiveness for all the hurt that we've caused you. And Lord, truly you are amazing. There is not one thing about you that is not perfect. There is none like you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to become before you clean, spotless, without blemish. Thank you for your son, Lord. Our great example in all things, our Messiah, our King. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen.